Hello, good evening. Welcome to Aula Europa, the headquarters of the European institutions in Barcelona. We're here today to discuss how to regulate AI, a uh, European vision organized by the uh, chairman of the Greens uh, EFA, Mr. Jordi Sole. AI is probably one of the buzzwords, but that remains still unknown. To be honest, just a few years ago, these two words were linked to science fiction mostly, but today they are part of our day-to-day -day language. And in fact, they will play an essential role in the future of technology. During our last mandate in February, 2017, the European Parliament passed a resolution where it, they ask the European Commission to present a proposal of European regulation of robots and AI in order to establish ethical standards and determine responsibility in case of accidents involving self-driven cars. This section is going to be translated simultaneously into English and Catalan. Artificial intelligence is a reality and obviously it is here to stay. Uh, these technologies are expected to bring a wide array of economic and societal benefits to a wide range of sectors, including environment and health, the public sector, finance, transport, home affairs and agriculture. Already today, AI is used to improve healthcare, optimize services delivery, efficiently manage energy consumption, and it's driving human progress in countless ways. Companies use AI-based applications to optimize their operations, but the deployment and use of IA entails both benefits and risks that trigger major legal, regulatory, and ethical debates. The main concerns are privacy, bias, discrimination, safety, and security. So given the fast development of these technologies, finding a balanced approach to regulate IA has become a central policy question in the EU. The key issues is how to minimize the risk and protect users without curtailing innovation and the uptake of IA. And after many debates, studies and impact assessments, the European Commission finally proposed in April 2021 the Artificial Intelligence Act. This is the very first attempt to enact a horizontal regulation of IA, and the EU wants it to be an example for the rest of the world to follow. I al llarg d'aquesta tarda, tant les persones... Throughout this evening, both the participants here in the room and those following the event online will have the opportunity to take part in two highly interesting debates involving institutional representatives and experts. I would like to thank you for your participation, both on site and online. And uh, I would like to say that MEP Marcel Collager, he's one of the uh, authors of the report to the Commission of AI, and Mr. Jordi Soler, who is one of the alternative speakers of the Greens EAF for the itinerary, digital itinerary 2013. Now I would like to give the floor to our facilitator, Hella Kettner. She is Danish, but since 2004 lives in Tarragona. She graduated in journalism uh, there and, in, and she's an expert in strategic communication. Thank you so much and welcome. Welcome to you all. Welcome to those who are here at the Parliament, at the European Parliament headquarters in Barcelona and for those following the event online. I'm going to speak in Catalan exclusively, considering that there's simultaneous translation into English. So for those uh, attending from home, you can choose the language you prefer. Just a quick reminder, you can send your questions to our speakers, use the chat function over Zoom, and you have until 7 p.m. to send your questions. We will start now with our first round table, and we will be doing so in a hybrid format. We have Jordi Soler, MEP for Greens EFA and uh, the chairman of the uh, EFA group. He's also vice president of the Greens parliamentary group, and he's also a member of the External Affairs Committee and the Committee for Industry Invest uh, Research 
and energy. He's going to be at, here on site and online. We have Mr. Killian Gross. He's the chief person of the head of unit of artificial intelligence policy development and coordination at DJ Connect, and also Marcel Collage, who's an MEP the Greens. Mr. Gross, you have now the floor. Good evening, uh, Ms. Barrera. Good evening. Oh, there's an echo, I think. Sorry, I can continue, but I, I hear myself rise, perhaps. I... Okay, now I think it should be okay. I hope you can you can hear me well. Otherwise, please indicate this to me. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you tonight uh, and to have this opportunity to discuss, which I think is very timely because we um, are heading really uh, towards a general approach in the council um, at the end of this year, hopefully. And we know, and I'm sure that Mr. Kolacha and um, uh, Mr. Soleil will speak about it later. The parliament as well is coming to, to a close. So we are really getting very um, in the decisive phase of these um, negotiations about the AI Act. And therefore, I think it's a good time to talk and to hear uh, your concerns and your, your questions and your um, observations. Um, the AI Act, perhaps I can summarize a little bit what the AI Act is, is, is about and what we have, what we wanted to do with it. Um, the starting point for us when we, we launched this work um, in, 20, uh, in 2020 was basically to see what we could, should we do a sectorial legislation? Should we look just at individual problems or should we look more horizontally? And our solution for this is that we need a horizontal AI act which should provide a comprehensive framework for the different AI applications, be it embedded in a product, be it self-standing um, outside of a product. The reason for this is that the problems which AI creates are the same, notwithstanding whether you um, um, notwithstanding whether the AI is embedded or the AI is self-standing, and this is related to the dependency on data, this is related to the opacity, uh, the the difficulty to really understand, the difficulty to understand in a transparent way how the AI functions. And these problems need to be addressed, and these problems occur wherever the AI is, is used, and that justifies, in our view, in a horizontal approach. This is, of course, complex, and this as well has as well made the, um, the legal act complex, because we cover a wide range of applications from an AI um, uh, in a car or in a drone to an AI which is used for a recruitment system. And in order to solve this, we have decided to go for a product-based approach. So we use basically the decades of experience we have in the commission to make products safe, and we treat AI here as a product, uh, and we try to make this product trustworthy and safe and respectful of fundamental rights and respectful as well of the need to ensure safety. This, the third fundamental principle which or question um, decision we have to take was that we wanted to take a risk-based approach. So the intensity of our regulation should follow the level of risk. So we have, um, because we want as well to, to merge a bit two objectives, to marry two objectives, because we want to achieve on the one hand side support for innovation, and on the other side we want to uh, regulate and to ensure that every AI which is used in Europe is trustworthy. And this we try to um, achieve via um, a risk-based approach where we have on top of the pyramid some prohibitions, a few, indeed, where we say this AI should not be on the European market. This is, for instance, social scoring by public authorities or biometric, remote biometric identification used by law enforcement authorities. Then we have a category of high risk where we believe that these systems are uh, possible to be used, but there must be it must be ensured that they correspond to the highest possible standards. And we try in the AI regulation to set five requirements how we could uh, make these AI systems trustworthy. Namely, the data must be good and representative. There must be a sufficient human oversight. There must be documentation. Uh, there must be some transparency. Um, and there must be some data retention. Uh, so these are essential things which need to be checked in advance, ex ante, before these products come to the market. And there must, of course, be controlled throughout the lifetime of the AI system when it's placed on the market or used. And then we have, on top of this, we have some transparency obligations. And on this high-risk list, you find um, applications like AI used in medical devices, but you may find as well AI used, for instance, in recruitment or AI used in an educational context. And we have 
classified the high risk in a methodology described in the regulation. And we have put different annexes where we list in detail which applications we consider to be high risk. So that should provide for the uh, provider and our developers as well a lot of legal certainty how to go about this, uh, this act. And then we have on a lower level, we have an article a bit about transparency obligations. So we think for certain uh, for certain AI systems, we need um, increased transparency. For instance, everybody should know when he or she is interacting with a chatbot or when he or she is subject to um, emotional recognition. Um, and then we have a lot of AI systems that we don't think that we need for the time being um, regulation. Here, we just offer voluntary codes of conduct. So you can go beyond. We invite you to go beyond, but that's not what we, what, what we want to prescribe. Or this should be done in a dynamic way. So we want to keep the system open. Therefore, we have foreseen that these different annexes with the high-risk cases can be adapted over time uh, with de via delegated acts in order to keep the system up and running. Um, perhaps then I may say, because there's a lot of things, of course, to say, but I don't want to take too much of the speaking time. Um, there is, of course, an important aspect. How can we ensure that the individual is sufficiently protected in the system? Because it's, in, of course, as I said in the beginning, a product-based system. We have foreseen for this in Article 64 of the regulation, this close cooperation between the market surveillance authorities and the equality bodies and all bodies who are responsible for ensuring that there is no discrimination or something alike. These bodies may access all the data from the market surveillance authorities, and they may even request um, testing, retesting of a system if need be. So like this, we try to ensure that the AI is as safe and as solid as a conventional system and the bodies which are there to control uh, um, possible violations of um, discrimination laws can exercise their duties as good uh, as they do normally vis-a-vis -vis AI. The second thing, which is always a second element which is often brought up, is that, of course, our approach is based very much on standards. And uh, because standards are, of course, used very often um, in classical product legislation. And then there's a question whether that you can use them as well for human rights. We think that standards are a good way to come forward because we have high level requirements in the regulation, which should then be filled out the standards because these standards are dynamic. It's very difficult in the legislation to describe in the last detail until the last detail, the technical specifications, because you're speaking about a very fast moving technology. But we want, and therefore we think standards make sense. They will be complemented by specifications which are implementing acts of the commission. So the commission can always come in if they we feel that the standard is insufficient uh, and replace it. And the standardization process should, of course, be open and inclusive in order to invite as well other stakeholders and just industry representatives, because we will here cover as well other elements, uh, namely fundamental rights. Last but not least, it's very important to think about enforcement, because one thing is to have a legislation. Another thing is that the legislation is really um, uh, properly be enforced and lift up. Here we want to leave it mainly to the member states to do this. The main enforcement will be done by the member states. We will have on the European level uh, some coordination and cooperation in order to ensure consistency. But it's important to bear in mind that as we use the uh, a product legislative approach, for us, it's a country of destination principle. So every consumer can go to the authority in the country where the product is placed on the market, not in the country where the uh, company is, is, is seated who has uh, provided that product. So that should already facilitate things a little bit. Last but not least, just to update you, this week uh, the Commission has um, proposed the last part of the puzzle. We have proposed a revision of the Product Liability Directive and um, a new AI Liability Directive. We have always said from the beginning in the White Book that uh, we think, of course, product safety and liability are two sides of the same coin because we need, we need both in Europe. Uh, we have now completed this, so you will see that if you read this, um, the proposal for product liability and the proposal for AI liability, which directly refer to our act, that we have as well now filled this element out so that you have reinfor reinforced transparency obligations so the consumer, which is who has been violated, has better access to information, to evidence, and his burden of proof has been alleviated. Perhaps I stop here, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions and the further discussion. Thanks a lot for your attention so far. Thank you very much, Mr. Killian Gross, for your contribution. You are very much on time because I forgot to say you to say something before beginning. I'm mean, very strict with the time, so I'm not going to hesitate to interrupt you. And now we will continue with our panel, we're going to delve 
into the role of the European institutions and we're gonna see why and how AI must be regulated. Our next speaker will be MEP Jordi Sole. Thank you very much, Keller, uh, Hella. It's going, well, it's, it's great to know that you're gonna be very strict with the time. Thanks to Sergi at the European uh, Parliament Office for putting together this uh, workshop and thanks to all the panelists who accepted the invitation to take part in this event. Also, thank you, Helle, for accepting the opportunity to act as the moderator. And thanks for everyone who has made this workshop possible. We've been talking about AI for a very long time now, and AI per se is nothing new. As a matter of fact, the European Union has been launching several initiatives for a very long time now in order to improve the well, AI systems throughout Europe. Sergi mentioned earlier that the European Parliament, since our last mandate, uh, well, statements have been made, uh, the impacts of AI have been assessed and how do they fit to the digital age? And sure, for a long, we've been working as a, as a legislator, uh, the proposal by the European Commission of the regulation uh, on AI. As you know, the EU pursues two uh, main objectives, two overarching uh, objectives, the green, uh, transition and the digital transition. Of course, everything related to AI regulation is a very important piece of the digital agenda of the EU. It was already embedded in the digital compass and others and there are many resources allocated under the programme Horizon Europe in order to initiate new research around AI. So as you can see, many things are being done around AI, but we were still missing. There was a lack of uh, legislation or regulation that would set common uh, standards for all EU members. This is a highly complex and technical legislation that tries to fit things that can be expressed in multiple ways and that rapidly evolve. So in my perspective, we should on the first hand focus on the development of trustworthy AI systems, safeguarding uh, citizens of certain risks adhering to systems and applications of AI, and then to protect citizens from risks. But now you might wonder why is a regulation necessary when we talk about the development and, commerce and marketing of AI uh, applications and algorithms, wouldn't that be a barrier for AI development? Well, I don't think so. I think it is timely. I think we do need a legal framework because as it happens with every kind of technology, it has some positive aspects, but it has also some negative aspects. And that's the case with AI. In the future, AI will have many applications and will have an impact in our day-to-day -day life. I'm sure it already has an impact, but it certainly will have a greater impact in the future. Culture, the environment, social services, public services. We see many areas where AI can be positively used uh, and where AI supports human progress and quality of life, but it can also entail some negative uh, consequences in terms of safety, health, environmental impacts, and human rights. The re regulation on AI 
she therefore set very high standards in terms of trustworthiness and protection from risks, from potential risks. And it should also establish uh, in a very clear and transparent manner the responsibility chain. We at the Greens EAFA in Europe believe that what Mr. Gross just shared, the revolution through risk, believe that it's, it's a good approach. So the regulation should use these risk-based approach and it needs to have requirements for AI systems that may pose higher risks, especially in terms of safety and fundamental rights. And above all, it should propose clear requirements regarding the quality of data uh, of the data used, an improvement of traceability, human oversight, and quality, robustness, and safety standards, and cybersecurity standards. This is all fine. We need standards. They are positive because they promote innovation. They can favor investment too in these systems. And this should be one of the goals of the regulation. Of course, we are aiming at a legal, legal stability and legal certainty for companies who want to distribute their products in the European market. And we all know that when there is legal certainty, well, um, trade and economic activities are promoted and facilitated and it's easier to place products in the market. We need this regulation because algorithms will be increasingly complex, AI systems will be increasingly complex and therefore the risk of deleterious impacts will increase over time. So it's the right time to regulate, to try and have a legal, a legal framework to basically um, limit those impacts. And as complexity goes up, the complexity of the algorithms, the ethical implications will become more apparent because AI supplements human intelligence, but it's, it's quite likely, it's quite the case already, that AI will overrun human intelligence. So having a framework, having a regulation on that is totally indispensable, in my opinion. So in the very little time that I have left, I'm sure, four minutes? No, rather two minutes. Okay, very briefly, there are four key elements and in our group in the parliament, we have wanted to focus on those in our uh, amendments and negotiations ongoing. The first one has to do with fundamental rights and non-discrimination. This event is entitled um, the EU's Artificial Intelligence Act, the European approach to AI. And what does it mean, this European approach? Well, the range of values that characterize us as Europeans. I don't want AI to be regulated in the EU as it would be done in different contexts um, in which maybe safety would prevail and population's control would prevail. We know that that happens and AI is being used as, the, as a supplement um, in authoritarian regimes and repressive regimes. We have to go the other way. We need AI not to be an instrument to crack down on our fundamental rights. And we have a special concern and probably Marcel Polaya will elaborate on this, which is the matter of biometrics and biometric technologies. Now, as for data, the trustworthiness of any AI system depends 
on the quality of data. And of course, regulation has a say in that. And then transparency and responsibility. We, I mean, behind any AI system, there needs to be a human uh, liability. Um, someone has to be in charge. Uh, if there is a negative consequence or impact, of course, you, the algorithm will not be to blame. Uh, someone will have to be um, liable, and this has to be clarified by the regulation. And finally, the sustainability of AI. We uh, submitted amendments because some AI systems are very uh, energy uh, intensive, not the algorithm itself, but the underpinning infrastructure. So we proposed to um, try and make headway towards energy efficiency and to try and reduce um, the use of um, materials that will not have a, a second life or cannot be recycled. So we focus very much on uh, the sustainability of AI, the environmental sustainability. And I'll leave it at that because my time's up. Thank you. I, I granted you 30 additional seconds. Before moving on to the last speaker of this initial panel, let me remind you that you can pose your questions and after this last speaker, we will have a round of questions. And I'm referring to the people in the room at the European Parliament's office in Barcelona or online. So we finish this initial panel with Marcel Colaya, who is connected online. Please. Thank you uh, very much for the floor. And thank you for inviting me. Um, to this event on this extremely important topic and uh, giving me the possibility to discuss this matter with you. Um, it became very clear uh, with the uptake of artificial intelligence and machine learning that it is of utmost importance to create legislation that will protect consumers and subjects of the use of artificial intelligence from harms and discrimination, uh, while at the same time allowing for development and growth of the AI sector in Europe. And um, uh, I have now the advantage that the two speakers who spoke before me uh, already described why we need a regulation of artificial intelligence and uh, what the approach should be and what are the problems that we've been seeing already with the use of artificial intelligence, uh, despite the uh, the advantages that the benefits uh, um, that brings that artificial intelligence brings, uh, that allows me uh, to stay uh, rather anecdotal. So let's look at some of the examples. Um, of the use of AI where it uh, could go wrong or it went wrong because we already have some experience. Uh, so one of the examples uh, could be um, a case um, of a large company, Amazon, who employed artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in order to help them to sort out um, CVs um, for the candidates that applied to the positions at the company. And at some point they figured out that actually um, the system prefers male candidates over female candidates. Uh, why did that happen? Well, that is actually the essence of uh, how machine lear learning works because, um, because um, you have a system that you feed with data, you learn the system with data, that's called a training data set. And um, then uh, when you work with the system, the system um, decides based on the data set that it has been trained with. So with that input, then it, it is able to, uh, to decide and for instance, give recommendation whether a candidate is a good candidate or, or a bad candidate for a particular position. 
And so it may happen that uh, if you construct this whole machine in a wrong way and train it with a wrong data set, that um, uh, the system decides because there was a bias in the previous decisions that the system was trained with that some uh, roles like software engineers, for instance, are better suited for male candidates than for female candidates. And this is exactly what happened uh, with this particular system. Um, and this is exactly one of the reasons why we need more transparency and why we need rules about around uh, the use of artificial intelligence so that we make sure that artificial intelligence, um, as we use it, respects fundamental rights and uh, that uh, does not um, bring uh, discrimination uh, to the decision making. Now, I am the opinion rapporteur um, in the cult committee in the European Parliament. The cult committee uh, is a committee that uh, looks into the aspects of culture, education and media. So that is what I was looking into uh, when drafting the opinion. And um, uh, I will give you another um, example from that area. Um, there is a, a Czech agency organizing admission exams for universities called STIO, and they have created their own e-proctoring system in collaboration with a Czech startup. Uh, after a negative experience with an e-proctoring company from Australia who had a different approach to protection of personal data of students. Um, so e-proctoring is a system uh, that helps uh, universities uh, to find out whether students are cheating during the exams if they take them online. Uh, and of course, they employ artificial intelligence in that task. Um, the reason why CEO decided um, to develop their own system is that because they did not approve the practice of the Australian company of providing, providing uh, footage, recordings of students uh, to outsource centers in India where employees were about to check if the student was or was not cheating. Um, so uh, they instead uh, creating their own software and a team of professionally trained uh, people who check. Um, but still they were worried about the legal aspects of their um, application and they mentioned and I quote them we are in fog in this aspect and it is not surprising given other examples with e-proctoring systems used in Europe there was a system used in University of Amsterdam um, University of Copenhagen and University of Bocconi in Milano uh, and the usage of uh, all um, were tested at courts and data protection authorities and authorities in the Netherlands and Denmark authorized the use while the data protection authority in Italy decided that it is illegal to use the system due to the lack of compatibility with data protection provisions. And that causes, of course, problems for the universities who develop or buy such systems uh, because the data protection authority can block it uh, and even give a fine to the university. So there is a financial loss, a financial loss and a need to invest in a new technology to keep the university running. So to, to avoid this situation, we need more clarity. And this is exactly the ambition of the Artificial Intelligence Act that um, would set the rules and uh, bring clarity uh, what is and what is not legal. Um, so, uh, in this opinion of this committee for culture and education, um, uh, we have with the committee extended um, the, uh, the systems that would be uh, categorized as high risk. And uh, the extension ex applies for exactly these e-proctoring systems and also systems to decide which area of study a student should, should follow. Like, let's say somebody is more suitable for math somebody is more suitable for learning languages because these technologies can very much negatively influence individuals uh, and their professional life. 
Um, uh, so I am really happy that my opinion was adopted by unanimity in the co commission in the end. And um, my, my last point um, is uh, on um, facial recognition and uh, biometric remote biometric identification. The European Commission put forward a proposal to ban the use of remote biometric identification systems in publicly accessible places for law enforcement and with some exceptions. And that, I believe, is a failed opportunity to prevent mass surveillance on European citizens. And I find, I find, sorry, I fight to change it because the proposal contains gaps. So for instance, uh, it is not only law enforcement authorities, but also private companies who may abuse such systems in publicly accessible places. Um, uh, for me, as the opinion reporter of the Committee uh, for Culture, Education and Media, uh, protection of journalists is really important. It's among my priorities. And I can remind cases of murdered journalists uh, in, in recent years in Slovakia, um, Malta, the Netherlands, Greece or Bulgaria. And if we do not ban remote biometric identification systems in publicly accessible places without exceptions, we put all these journalists in danger. Uh, we definitely do not want a private security agency to place a camera uh, opposing to uh, um, an office uh, of um, newspapers and track who, who goes in. Um, the Pegasus scandal um, in Poland, Hungary, Greece, but also in Spain, revealed that govern governments may easily have an appetite for spying on opposition uh, representatives, on NGOs, on journalists, on uh, public prosecutors. Uh, and if they spied with Pegasus, which breaks into your phone and uh, tracks everything you do, um, spies on you uh, when you sleep, uh, when you're on, uh, in, in bathroom, when you uh, have a business meeting, what more principle would prevent them to spy also with facial recognition cameras? And facial recognition, I remind, is also abused in Russia, where Putin's regime used it on participants of anti-war demonstrations to track them down and persecute. And I ask how long it is going to take until we start hearing such stories from Budapest. So for these reasons, um, I believe that the exceptions from the ban introduce a loophole. And I believe my time is up. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'm, um, uh, I'm really happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. And thanks for being so compliant with the time because we have many speakers today. There's a question on Zoom for Kilian Gross. The question has to do with how the access to regulation for SMEs can impact because there might be legal problems for SMEs and this can be a barrier to innovation in AI in Europe, which means that if that, that we will lay behind and we will depend on other countries like China, are you thinking about this risk? Thanks a lot. We are indeed thinking um, a lot about this. So the first thing we have done is we want to create a level playing field. So wherever the AI system has been developed, if it's put on the market in Europe, it has to comply with our rules. It's the first and most important thing. So it doesn't help that you develop the AI system in China. If you want to sell it in Europe, you have to, to play with our rules. Otherwise, you can't, you can't sell it. So that should as well for our SMEs and our developers um, ensure a certain level playing field. Then we are, of course, aware that what we create is a certain burden. It's impossible. I mean, there is a balance between uh, 
creating trustworthiness, uh, creating rules, and of course, um, creating a burden for which is then it has to be borne by by developers. But we try to create to keep this as limited as necessary in order to achieve the objective. So we try really, we, we did a lot of thought. That's why we work with standards. That's why we work with this market based uh, system. And we, um, because we know that industry is very um, familiar with working with this kind of standard and they can integrate them, quality management standard, risk management standard, they can integrate them in their processes and then uh, they can normally work and live with them rather well. That's our experience. What we heard from industry when we developed this regulation was basically provide clarity. The only thing industry really does not want is uncertainty. So that you have unclear obligations, a lot of self-responsibility, self-assessment, but and that's why we work with these kind of lists. On top of this, and this is perhaps worth mentioning, we have created, I think, two really important elements. One is we want to set up sandboxes. So we want to create basically um, protected areas where uh, companies can uh, try, where they can test, and where they can as well um, uh, be supervised and supported by the regulatory authorities in order to prepare as well for the conformity assessment. So that should help them. And we're very grateful that Spain is the first country in the EU who uh, wishes now to test already these sandboxes before we have the regulation entered into force. It's a, quite a big and important project in Spain. And we work very closely together with the Spanish colleagues to set it up and really to train and to get, gain experiences what this takes. The president, the French presidency has then even added here um, real life testing. So the possibility to test AI systems under certain conditions in real life that should as well help um, our companies. Then on top of this, we have foreseen a number of alleviations for small and medium-sized companies. So they should have priority access to these sandboxes, but they should as well have reduced fees for the conformity assessment. Uh, they have, and in the negotiations in the council, the presidencies have introduced as well further um, alleviations like, um, uh, for instance, they should be exempted from quality management or they should be exempted from certain obligations for general purpose AI. So all this shows that there is a lot of awareness, I think, about um, what the needs for SMEs are. We from the EU, from the Commission side, what we want as well to do is we want to provide, in particular, digital innovation hubs. We will have one hub in each member state specialized on AI. We will provide testing and experimentation facilities on AI, so where they can even test and in real time, in real life, test their systems. So we will try to accompany this regulation with a number of support measures on our side in order to alleviate this, because we have the same objective. We want AI in Europe, we want to use it because the technology, as Mr. Kolach has rightly pointed out, carries some risk, there is no doubt, but it carries as well a number of benefits. I mean, climate models can work with that, you can optimize traffic, you can reduce pollution. There's a lot of things, very beneficial things for the individual, but as well for society, what you can do with AI. And we want our societies to benefit from this. So that's how we try to, to strike the balance a bit. With a, a targeted and hopefully well-designed regulation, and with targeted and design, um, support measures which are really designed for the needs of SMEs. Thank you very much. Does anyone else want to <coughs> add something to this very complete answer? Otherwise, I saw a hand raised here in the room. Let's wait for the handheld microphone. This is a question related to what our colleague said earlier in the sense that technology is more advanced in countries like the US and China. So how the standards in the future will erode the efficiency of this technology here in Europe? And I would like to ask directly Jordi, is it foreseen to initiate a dialogue with the US? I know it's going to be harder with China, but is it possible to open a discussion discussion with the US in terms of AI. Well, we are in a constant dialogue with the US concerning many matters, among them uh, technological and digital matters. When the European regulation comes into force, it is going to be the first of its kind in Europe and the one that pursues an horizontal approach towards AI, I'm sure that co-legislators will or aim is going to be to pave the way 
in the regulation of AI, trying to strike the right balance. The head of unit just said it. We have to find the balance in letting AI evolve and innovation to flourish in the market. But at the same time, we need to protect fundamental rights and limit the risks that we just mentioned. And I'm sure that the approach in the US it might be in a sense of a more general overview, will be very similar to the one, to the European one. And I know of very specific dialogues concerning technological matters. I don't know whether other panelists have more detailed information in this regard. If you would like to say something, I, I'm speaking to, the, to those following online. Uh, I may add one thing. Um, so we need to realize that the European Union is um, a regulatory superpower, basically. And I, I would not underestimate that power whatsoever. Uh, we have seen it in the past uh, in other uh, types of uh, legislations where um, it's not only that other jurisdictions have been copying the same approach that has been taken by the European Union. Like if we take the GDPR as an example, then uh, we see that in, in under jurisdictions, they are taking the same approach. Um, like in Brazil, for instance, or, or in India, uh, but also the companies um, very often um, uh, find it the most reasonable and most effective approach, basically, that they um, that they shape their products in a way how the, the European regulations um, um, describe or demand uh, by by the rules that are set by these uh, by by this European legislation, and that influences, of course, um, how these products are shaped worldwide. Um, so, uh, so this is this is one element of it. Another another element is that um, it is also in the uh, in the interest of other um, jurisdictions to, uh, to to take a similar approach if it's proven in your hope that it works. And I worked um, in this legislature on a. Um, uh, on legislation that is called the Digital Markets Act, uh, which um, is a legislation that sets the rules for the largest uh, corporations in, in the digital markets to set um, a level playing field so that also other companies can, can compete. And I have learned that uh, now the United States um, are working on their so-called Digital Markets Act because it absolutely makes sense what Europe has done in that field. So I would expect something like that happening around the world as well when it comes to artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. If no one else wants to say anything else. Okay, we do have a question here. Good evening. Well, I don't have a question itself. I have a comment aimed at any panelist. Over this discussion, I have the feeling that we are legislating from fear, not opportunity. We focus on many things that are needed for the mass processing of data to avoid that a system discriminates against us in an automatic way, for example. But we never ask ourselves when a person, when a human being does that, and the, the colleague or that example that was mentioned, Amazon, discriminating against people based on their CVs and choosing just male candidates. But 
we this situation would have gone unnoticed if such discrimination had been made by a human being, not a machine. So we should believe that this legislation I'm, aims at protect certain rights if this will allow us to have a system that protects citizens' rights. And in this regard, we shouldn't fear what's coming upon, but we should conceive it as a new way to protect our rights. And I see this in a positive manner. So we should rather focus on how these systems are implemented, not from the lens of risk, because the word IA is making us aware of many things that were already happening. People were already being discriminated against on, uh, because of their gender. And when this was done by a human being, this was out of our control. But when it is done by a machine, by AI, we, there might be some room for control. So we should see new opportunities arising here. Also, if we label things as AI and people want to step over it, they are going just to remove the label and they will, will come up with a new term. And then we, have, we will have a loophole in our legislation. So I see this as an opportunity and legislation will allow, should allow us to reinforce the protection of uh, our rights and to make sure that no one goes uh, or, or oversteps those rights. Well, thank you very much. Since our next round table is precisely on that, on the, on that, on the benefits and risks, we're gonna leave that. Uh, unless you have a very short comment on what was just said. Otherwise, we will move on with the next panel. Yes, very briefly, having participated in the drafting of the opinion of the Commission and as a spokesperson of my group, I had never had the feeling that we are regulating AI from fear. I see, I think that everyone sees a, a great opportunity. But of course, filters need to be applied. This means that standards must be of quality and they must be very high standards. And you need legislation that makes it compulsory to follow them. Otherwise, our standards will lead us to a kind of AI that won't have the positive impact that we desire. So, of course, I do support re uh, legislation and regulation that takes into consideration those huge opportunities, but that at the same time limits the risk. And that defines in a very clear manner the uh, chain of responsibilities. And I think that's the approach taken by the European Parliament and also the European Commission and probably uh, the one of our, the member states. Thanks to the panelists, our first round table, we are now gonna um, change our panelists. There are six of them who are here with us today on site and one is going to participate online. This Roundtable is about citizens and business, benefits and risks of AI. We have Katarina Rodelli, she is an EU policy analyst at Access Now. She will be participating online. We have David Gonzalez, he's a group head of big data analytics and AI for Vodafone. We have Jennifer Woodard, she's the CEO of Insect Intelligence. Montserrat Guardia Güell, co-founder and CEO of Big Onion. Artur Serra, deputy director of the I2CAT Foundation. Maybe IDOSCAT. Josep Yados, computer vision center director. And last but not least, Josep Luis Martí Marmol. He's a commissioner for the Planetary Wellbeing Initiative at the uh, Pompeu Fabra University, and uh, he's also um, he also a lecturer of uh, 
philosophy in law. Okay, so now we're gonna change the people here on stage. Yes, all at once, make it comfortable. There's no much room, but make yourself comfortable. Okay, so we're gonna start with the introduction of our panelists, Katerina Rodelli, she's following us online. And you have now the floor and let me remind, remind you that we're going to be very strict with the time. So the floor is yours now. Thank you, thank you. And please um, feel free to tell me when I have to stop and I'm not, not respecting the rules. So um, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Katarina Ardalli. I work for Access Now, a digital rights organization um, based here in Brussels, but with a, a global perspective. We uh, work for uh, protecting and extending the digital rights of people across the globe. Uh, and I'm here today, actually I'm stepping in um, to replace my colleague, Sarah Chender, uh, who works for uh, EDRI, the European Digital Rights uh, Initiative, a network of digital rights organization of which Access Now is part um, of. So my intervention today, since I'm civil society, will focus on how the AI Act can prevent harm, uh, can protect the fundamental rights, and also empower people when they engage with AI systems. And much of what I will mm, be talking about is actually the, the result of the work of a coalition of civil society organizations, not only digital rights organizations, but also um, organizations reflecting uh, non-discrimination rights, equality, migration, and fair trial rights. Um, so what I would like to do now is to uh, share with you four main considerations that we are uh, calling for and, and bringing to the attention of the co-legislators um, to ensure that the AI Act uh, protects fundamental rights. So the first uh, recommendation that we, we have uh, to ensure that the AI Act is centered on people's rights is that um, the AI Act should develop an accountability model, like a stronger accountability model for users of AI systems, meaning uh, those that will deploy uh, AI systems. In fact, in the commission proposals, we can see um, a strong focus on what developers of AI system uh, must do and focusing particularly on the technical specification. But how having this focus is missing um, the risk that takes place uh, in the moment based on the context where the AI system is um, is deployed. Uh, in fact, even a perfectly a perfect a perfect technically speaking uh, AI system could lead to uh, harm of fundamental rights. Why? Because the harms depends extremely on the context um, of deployment. Um, so while there are many positives on the obligations on the developers, we would suggest that the AI Act would also put two extra obligations uh, on users. The first one is uh, an obligation to conduct a fundamental rights impact assessment before an AI system is deployed. Um, so the user that intends to deploy the system should um, indicate what are the categories of groups uh, or individuals that will be affected, what that are, are the fundamental rights implications, if there are uh, accessibility required, the accessibility requirements for people with disabilities are met, what are the environmental impacts. So on the basis of, of this assessment, then the user should 
um, decide if the AI system is compliant with fundamental rights. The second obligation concerns the database. So according to the um, commission proposal, providers of AI systems should register uh, high risk systems into a European database. Whereas we suggest that this obligation should uh, fall on the um, on, on the users, on the deployers, because they are the ones that can specify the context of deployment and therefore have a 360 degrees um, view on the final impacts of these uh, high risk systems. The second recommendation that we have um, has to do with individual rights and redress mechanism. So the recommendation that we have is that the regulation should empower people to exercise their rights, especially for people that are negatively impacted by AI systems. And we have um, a long list of examples where um, people's fundamental rights were violated through the use of an AI system. Um, some of these examples were mentioned already, but like, let me just briefly speak about one infamous example, which is the Dutch child care benefit scandal. So since 2013, um, the Dutch authorities have been using a automating profiling system uh, to assess the level of risk uh, of fraud that was posed by the beneficiaries of childcare um, welfare. Well, um, this system, following an investigation, it was found that the the uh, the screening rules uh, heavily took into consideration protected characteristics such as nationality. This means that people with without a Dutch citizenship, mostly with a non-European citizenship, were flagged as people that possibly um, could fraud uh, the system. This had real life impact um, and it was not like an opportunity, unfortunately, to um, address this discrimination practices because like what this uh, practice led to was uh, people were had their benefits suspended, um, arbitrary investigations into family situations, um, fines imposed for alleged um, fraud of the system, but also uh, children were displaced from, from their families. We are speaking about a number of a thousand children displaced from their families um, as a result of the discrimination that was entrenched into these um, these profiling systems. So um, this is just one example uh, of of how how fundamental rights could be um, violated. Therefore, it is of crucial importance that the AI Act uh, offers the possibility to people to exercise their rights. So what we suggest is that the Commission proposal now we don't have individual rights. Therefore, strengthening individual rights and also for seeing a right. Um, a redress mechanism that would allow individuals, but also collectives to feel a complaint to national authorities and therefore ensure that the AI Act is an instrument uh, to make justice as well as regulating the use of AI systems. The third recommendation re regards the overall framework of the AI Act. So we know that it's a risk-based approach. We have like four different categories of risk, unacceptable risk, high risk systems, limited risk, and, and all the others. But we we believe that like this framework is quite rigid compared to the fast changing technology that we are talking about. And then if the AI Act has to, will have the longevity and also the global um, significance that we we all hope for, there we should have a more flexible and future proof um, framework that will allow the AI Act to update these risk categories. Uh, based on the new technologies that will be developed or will be in use in Europe. And therefore, we believe that the AI Act should include a way to update uh, the prohibitions, uh, about which I'm, gonna, I'm going to speak in a moment, and also create new categories of high-risk systems. Um, and I'm going to close uh, with the prohibitions bit. So the Commission uh, proposed rightly, um, acknowledged rightly the fact that some uses of AI systems are simply unacceptable because they violate uh, European fundamental rights and European law. When we speak about an unacceptable risk, uh, we are talking about um, 
systems that pro provide technological solution to problems that are societal, like social in nature, systems that risk to reinforce and balance power uh, relationships uh, and also reinforce structures of uh, discrimination. Uh, Marta Polaya before was speaking about remote biometric identification in public accessible spaces and how this represents a risk of mass surveillance, but also other systems that present an unacceptable risk are predictive policing. So systems that will determine that you will commit a crime even before you do that, um, or maybe you won't. Um, or lie detectors that are used at the border against people crossing the borders and that reinforce these constant uh, suspicions towards uh, people on the move. So prohibitions in the AI Act have the potential to prevent life ruining consequences uh, before they take place. So we welcome Article 5 with the prohibitions, but in order to actually prevent the harms, um, this should be like Article 5 should be expanded first. The prohibition on remote biometric ident uh, identification should take pl place fully with no exception because when the infrastructure infrastructure is there, uh, there is room for uh, abuse. Uh, second, a, a new prohibition should be added on predictive policing, um, and it, it was actually proposed by the uh, colleading rapporteurs um, in the European Parliament to add a new provision on predictive policing. Then mm, I believe that I, I have to close. Uh, also, like new provisions uh, on migra uses of AI in migration at the border context should be taken into consideration as well as emotion recognition and biometric categorization systems. So um, what we want to like what uh, access now and the uh, coalition want to bring into this conversation is that the regulation has the strong potential to set a global standard on how innovation can take place but in the name of uh, the people and fundamental rights um, i thank you for your attention um and also apologies i cannot will not stay for the q and a because uh, i will have to leave at 7 p.m um, thank you very much Thank you very much, Katerina Rodelli. We now hand it over to David Gonzalez, Head of Analytics and AI for Vodafone. Let me remind you that you can post your questions online and the Q&A will take place after the presentations. Mm, highlighting something that I think is important is that AI and let's say analytics in general has been around society for many decades already. Now it has become a very popular term and a very popular technology, mainly because I think that lots of bad use cases and bad applications of AI have become very popular for society in general. It is true that if you look at examples like the ones they were saying before about maybe bias in um, any type of job position depending on your gender or even on your religion or your age, is um, obviously is a, is a wrong use of AI. But if we think that there are many use cases of AI, like maybe uh, creating a new medical treatments against diseases or cancer, everyone in society would be completely in favor. So it always depends in the angle and obviously the use cases where it is applied. We can never forget that AI is a combination of data, different mathematical algorithms that brought together are, let's say, impacting and transforming our society. So I brought just a few examples of slides that I want to show you of the way that we're looking at AI in Vodafone as, as a group. Um, obviously, we understand that the, the main concern of the European Union has to do with the high risk use cases. And I'm sure that that will be a really important debate of what can be defined as a high risk use case and what cannot. You were giving an example of, um, let's say, biometric identification. If you think about that and that you are identifying people that simply have a different political opini opinion to uh, the politicians in a country, that might be a really bad use case. But if you think that maybe due to biometric identification, you can prevent a terrorist attack, imagine now that we are going to have an Olympics, uh, the Olympics Games in Europe uh, really, really soon. And if you think about that, and maybe it's going to save lives, maybe most people in the world would be completely in favor of using, in this case, biometric identification. So it's just a message that I think is important that this is not something new that has just come up. I think it's just, um, let's say, a new a technology that has been around for many, many years, 
that has become very, very popular because of some bad examples of how it has been uh, applied recently. Um, really, really briefly, we, we look at AI basically, and, and in, in this first example, we just mentioned some of the use cases where we apply big data and AI on a regular basis in, in the telco industry. If I tell you that we use AI to basically improve our networks in certain locations where maybe the coverage doesn't allow you to watch a movie or, or a video on YouTube, most likely people would be completely in favor. Also to avoid maybe having a bad communication when you're making a phone call. That is an example of use case where big data is improving connectivity and is improving obviously our, our, our personal experience. If I tell you also that uh, during the pandemic, that has been one of the worst times in the, in the recent history, we use big data and AI to collaborate with public administration, with governments across Europe, to understand the impact of the of the virus understanding that let's say with 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 social contact and mobility these were the two key input data sets that could help governments predict the impact of the pandemic everyone would be completely in favor because we were using simply anonymized and aggregated data to understand the the, the impact of the virus and help governments make better decisions if i tell you that we're using for instance ai as part of our customer experience and for instance with chatbots to help people let's say solve any question or any incidents in maybe just a few sec a few minutes instead of maybe having to be on a phone for 10 minutes everyone will say that that's a really good use case and it's improving uh, people's lives and even think about beyond if if i ask all of you that using ai maybe to go to work is going to take you th uh, 20 minutes instead of one hour because you can out out smart traffic most people would say i'd rather get to work in 20 minutes using data and ai rather than take uh, one hour. So, in summary, I think this is all about the way that you look at it. If we see the the glass half full or half empty, you will have always people with different opinions. Um, I think this all has to do also with a set of principles that I'm sure, even at the even in the EU, uh, all countries, all member states will be completely in favour. One of them has to do with transparency and accountability. For instance. Uh, I'm speaking about Vodafone because obviously it's my company, but if you are a Vodafone client, in two clicks, you can access your permissions in my Vodafone app. You are completely accountable to the, for basically changing the way that the company uses your data. If you don't want us to use your data to recommend you better products and services, you simply opt out. If you want us to use the, your data for other use cases, you, you can also simply opt in. Even for use cases that are completely, I would say, with no impact to anyone, like using anonymized data and aggregate it to help, for instance, a city council or a government understand mobility or understand tourism, even in that case, you can also opt out for the use of that data. So in summary, it is really important that companies do the effort on incorporating basically permissions and full transparency in the way that data is, is used. Second has to do with ethics and fairness. Obviously, if I tell you that, if that we use uh, attributes like age and gender to build a model that maybe is biasing any type of, let's say, behavior or customer experience, we would be doing something wrong. So it's all about basically understanding the, the way and the data that you have, understanding how it's being used, and being able to always analyze if that the model that you have developed using any machine learning technique is really biasing and is, in this case, is discriminating any collective in, in society. So we also, for instance, since we are involved on all data scientists, we signed as well a code of ethics that ensures that the way that we work follows our best practice and the uh, ethical responsibility that we have as a company. Preservation on privacy and, and security. These examples are really important. All the data that we have in our platforms is completely anonymized. Every use case that we work on requires approvals from our group privacy teams and also privacy in our, in our local markets. We have really advanced, let's say, security best practices and, and software deployed across our uh, big data platforms to make sure that data doesn't leave, let's say, our secure platforms and we give the best use about data. Obviously, things like human rights, diversity, inclusivity. So in summary, there are a set of principles that are essential to protect the way that we're using big data and AI and, and make sure that all society understands that this is a good thing that has arrived in our lives and is going to stay and we just need to make sure that we use big data and ai in use cases that are considered 
non-high risk, and even if they are a high risk use case, you get all the permissions and approvals that are needed to give basically uh, all the potential benefits from that, that use case. And I finish with the, with the last slide, that is uh, max maximizing the benefits of, of AI while managing the disruption uh, of its implementation. And I'll give you one example of, of another yeah, use case that maybe is very popular for many of you, that is when Gary Kasparov uh, competed against Deep Blue many years ago, the first time Gary Kasparov won. And that, and that proves that obviously AI requires re really good data. But today, something that Gary Kasparov mentioned, and I think he mentioned this the second time that he lost against Deep Blue is, there is no better system in our world than the combination of people and technology, the combination of people and AI. This is the, the way that we're going to thrive as society. It doesn't mean that the path is going to be easy. We have examples of use cases that we, we have to avoid. But no doubt, technology is here to stay and it's going to make a better world for every one of us. Thank you. Muy bien. Muchas gracias, David González. Ay, gracias. Thank you very much. Don seguim aquest segon panell um, okay, I'm Jennifer Woodard, panel, uh, CEO of Insect Intelligence. Woodard, who is the CEO of Insect Intelligence. Thanks a lot. And I remind you that you have uh, 10 minutes. I'm going to try to speak really fast. <laughs> Sorry to the, the translator. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll speak from notes. So I wanted to talk to you. Thank you, David, for mentioning terrorism and public safety, because that's kind of what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I want to talk about the benefits of AI for uh, the fight against online harms. Um, I'm Jennifer Woodard. I'm co-founder of Inside Intelligence. We're based here in Barcelona, in spite of my accent. Um, we are uh, leveraging, leveraging AI in the fight against uh, terrorism, disinformation, and uh, things like human trafficking. So we began our research back in 2016 with a challenge that we were facing and we're grappling with, which was the detection of radical content online. Uh, we started working in uh, FCT programs under the European Commission's uh, Horizon and Horizon 2020 uh, research programs. And what we were doing is basically trying to detect discrete signals of harmful content online uh, in order to assist law enforcement and uh, intelligence agencies here in here, Europe. And then, you know, six years later, uh, social media continues to uh, have this issue. Uh, what we call open source intelligence is uh, information that's coming from social media. And there is massive amounts of uh, harmful content that's uh, threatening, that can be harmful for children, for individuals who are vulnerable, and it still hasn't been dealt with. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you about the benefits of AI for this, and also some of the pitfalls of not employing really strong ethical frameworks for the type of this technology. So if we take a look back at what we were looking at back then, um, it, we've been talking about this for years and years, but you know what we're dealing with is basically finding needles in haystacks in terms of massive amounts of content online. You cannot really find uh, terrorists or criminals or uh, child abusers manually. That's just not very uh, reasonable because of the, 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 the massive amounts of data that are there. So you can just, we won't go through them all, but you can see on the screen that, you know, there's billions of, of pieces of data that are being posted online every day. And, you know, who's controlling that? The social media companies, uh, other smaller social media companies that are probably not patrolling it at all. And uh, obviously you have the introduction of things like bots and fake users. And it's really hard to detect these types of threats without AI. Um, so how would you do it? Well, we started with a simple way to detect jihadi terrorist uh, content online uh, using AI. And what we needed was a really sound methodology for doing this. So we invented, uh, we didn't invent it, we combined a lot of technologies and methodologies that we, we had been studying uh, together to kind of build some algorithms to, to detect this type of content. I won't go really deep into this because it's quite technical, but I think uh, I think Marcel mentioned earlier, uh, data sets are being used to train uh, certain types of algorithms, and if the data sets aren't good, then obviously the output is not good. But what we're doing is, yeah, basically using natural language processing uh, on known uh, suspicious messages that were collected by law, law enforcement agencies and then mach employing machine learning models in order to be able to detect content that's similar to that. So obviously, like I said, humans uh, humans are the people that are annotating the data sets. The data sets are being built into machine learning models, so may not may or may not be perfect, but this brings up a topic that has been brought up before, which is there always needs to be a human in the loop. When it comes to AI, you don't just deploy a system and let it run on its own. There needs to be someone who's actually uh, having a look at this. 
Another methodology that's used is also network analysis. And what it's doing is basically understanding interactions between users. And why is that important is because you're able to detect maybe uh, a narcotics ring or uh, radicalization spread or how uh, you know terrorists are organizing themselves or who they're uh, basically targeting in terms of radicalization. So the the use case, for instance, for counterterrorism is is quite simple. It's, you know, what are they talking about with natural language processing? How are they interconnected with network analysis? Who's the leader uh, using also network analysis? And what will they do next is a, a deep learning modeling uh, that you could potentially use. So this is all very research and theoretical. This is not a, a, a tool. And other things that deep learning can be used for, for instance, you know, uh, understanding if someone's very vulnerable to be radicalized, uh, fraud, um, bot detection, geopolitical dynamics. So right now Europe is in the midst of, you know, informational warfare against uh, some state actors. Uh, how do you detect these campaigns in order to build uh, campaigns also to maybe do counter messaging against people or uh, state actors or, or non-state actors who are attacking uh, Europe? So the online threat landscape has changed since we first started. Uh, I would say that the, the biggest change is that the social media landscape is different. Um, there are fragmented threats across all, all uh, niche platforms, dis dis disparate sources. Now gaming and streaming platforms are being used for radicalizing and, and, and actually spreading terrorist related content. There are new behaviors uh, of terrorists uh, and extremists that have kind of uh, exploded during the pandemic. And then we have what I feel is the scariest part, which is AI powered disinformation. So we talk about disinformation a lot, fake news, but now we are facing the threat of something that is actually powered by, by AI. So in order to get in front of it, you need to actually use AI. Um, don't need to tell you what <laughs> what disinformation is doing in terms of democracy, in terms of you know basically putting pub public budgets in in uh, jeopardy in the case of COVID nineteen. But I do want to tell you about a little bit about the evolution of disinformation. Um, we've moved from what is organic disinformation that was being written by individual users in many cases and conspiracy theorists, which was problematic, right? But it had a limited impact. Now we're in a, a space where there's disinformation as a service or actually uh, state and non-state actors who are employing disinformation campaigns, uh, paying people to build them and, uh, and spread them across uh, the internet. This is also a really uh, bad thing, and it hasn't been dealt with. The only way to deal with it, in my opinion, is AI. And what's emerging, which is the scariest part, is AI-enabled disinformation campaigns. And that's what I call nuclear disinformation. So it's developed by AI. They can be autonomous algorithms that are actually generating convincing texts that make you believe that it's written by a person and uh, also create new users that um, basically convince you that they're real people. So uh, the challenge with that is they're powered by complex uh, language models. And in order to be able to deal with this, we actually need to build our own AI with complex language models because the amplification effect of this is nuclear. So instead of having 10 people spreading disinformation, you have millions of bots and millions of fake users that are doing that. Are doing that. Another aspect of this is hate speech. So with this type of amplification, we've seen a, a, a rise in things like anti-Semitism, uh, uh, lots of discrimination against people uh, from different countries. And these are you know, both bad things for society and they're also security threats. There's new areas, like I mentioned before, online gaming and esports. And then I wanted to switch gears and talk about something completely different, which is where I see this going in terms of the way AI can actually benefit uh, future online harms. We have the metaverse. What you know? What is it? Nobody's entirely sure yet, uh, but we know that massive investment is going into this by major you know companies. Some of them located outside of Europe, and it's essentially supposed to be the future of the internet. But what can happen there? So right now. Um, not much is actually happening, but it can be used for a lot of fun things, right? Like gaming, attending events, uh, interacting with brands. But uh, there are, as with all fun places, bad things will happen, like the internet in general. So what kinds of bad things are we talking about? It can become a new breeding ground for radicalization. Um, there could be an avatar of, I don't know, like Osama bin Laden, who's there to radicalize you, looks like a real person, a hologram. Um, that's a scary thing to think. Uh, it could be an echo chamber for extremist content. It can be a place where disinformation becomes even more convincing because the people that are talking to you, they look real and they're convincing you of things that, that are maybe not true. 
Um, you can also use it as a terrorist training camp. So as you can see, there are lots of challenges here, but none of these challenges are going to be able to be met without AI because AI will be the ones who is the, the, the technology that's actually building these things. And you can actually simulate bad things. You could simulate a terrorist attack to ensure that you hit your target, to ensure that you kill as many people as possible. So I'm not trying to depress anyone or scare anyone, but these are all things that could be possible in the, the metaverse that we need to think about. Um, so these new threats, they require new AI, um, but you know, AI doesn't come, we shouldn't just uh, have it at any cost. Um, I'm a proponent of regulation. Um, I believe that we need uh, guardrails in some ways because the, the challenges are huge. Um, I really appreciate the way the, the parliament and the, the entire uh, European system has been working with AI innovators in this aspect. Uh, we worked, I worked myself on uh, some of the position papers for the Digital uh, SME Alliance together with the, the European Parliament for the AI Act. Um, and one, the things that we want to talk about are basically kind of uh, building off of what David was talking about is that there are some basic things that need to be respected uh, when building these types of systems. Um, you see them here, human agency, technical robustness, privacy, data governance, uh, diversity, non-discrimination, and fairness. Um, and I'll just get into very quickly, you know, some of the things that need to be taken into consideration are eth ethical systems requirements, uh, all of the things that need to be taken into account when we build algorithms, when we um, collect data, when we use data sets, when we annotate them, there's lots of different um, pitfalls and dangers. And bias is the biggest one. So bias can pop up anywhere, can pop up in data sets that are not representative, that are uh, annotated by people who inherently have bias because they're human beings, um, in the testing data, in models, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that um, Heli's gonna tell me to quit. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we can talk more about this if you guys have additional questions. Uh, the ethical aspect is extremely important to, to AI researchers like us. And uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, if, if you're luckily enough, if you're lucky enough, someone will ask you and you can like Yeah, then I'll just go back to my notes. Exactly. <laughs> uh we'll continue with our next panelist. It is now time for Montserrat Guardia. She's the CEO, uh, co-founder and CEO of Big Onion. Thank you very much. I am going to speak in Catalan. Well, I would like to build on uh, the thoughts that have been shared so far. I really celebrate and applaud the fact that we're talking about AI, as David mentioned, uh, there has been decades. AI has been around for decades now, so it's nothing new. And as Jennifer said, AI exists. It is highly complex and it exists for very young people who are already working on it. So there are people who are still not of age and they are already programming AI because it is free. Everyone can do it. Everyone can connect to uh, software platforms and all, well, everyone can program actually AI. So it is not extraordinary anymore. It is ordinary already. So we should conceive AI as an ordinary aspect of our day-to-day -day lives. And it is happening now. So what are the challenges today? That's the lens we should use. Our perspective, and again, I applaud that this discussion has been ongoing at the European Parliament for years now. We should identify where IA is already present. And well, that's fantastic. If you haven't uh, visited the Parliament's website, I highly encourage you to do so, because there's a lot of information that is available in multiple languages. So what is IA? I would like to talk about digital space. I would like to go a little bit further. I would like to go one step further in terms of what AI is. AI uh, layers made of two things, machines, machinery on the one hand, machinery that is extraordinarily well connected, machinery that is extremely complex, by the way, nanoelectronics I'm talking about. So we're talking about machinery that is already non-visible and also software, that would be the second element. And the software layers are developed by millions of developers 24 seven all over the world. 
we are in the 21st century. Software is free. Many people can develop software. It can be developed uh, all over. And also software can be private. Many companies are working on private software. And it is basically line codes that can be combined with each other. So we know that there are several layers, machinery, hardware, and software. And now the question would be why? What's the main purpose? What, what for? What's the purpose of these co line codes? And that's what we call the narrow AI. We've been working on that and we've defined very specific purposes. David said earlier, he talked about self-driven uh, cars or Jennifer mentioned uh, chatbots, social media. So these things are already there. They already work on AI and they serve very specific purposes. They make our life easier. Also, um, concerning health issues. And of course, in engineering and to make machines fly. So we are actually leaving AI. It's not extraordinary anymore. And my question, well, my, uh, what I would like to talk about now is about the new IA. Uh, for three to four years now, there's been a great evolution that has brought about concepts of deep learning and evolution and a new kind of IA. And I think that when legislating, we should take into consideration the new AI. New AI goes beyond uh, serving a task. It's not about what IA does. In that case, AI helps us maximizing ourselves, what we think, what we are, and what we want to do. So now I'm referring to IA in capital letters, and I would like to focus this discussion combined with regulators. What can be achieved with this new kind of IA uh, as citizens? Somebody asked a question earlier on that topic. To keep things simple, I will say that humankind has been through that already. Humankind has already discovered new areas in 1923 when this picture was taken, Emilia Earhart. I really love that picture and I love that woman because I think it's a great example of where we stand in the digital era. At that time, uh, flying machines were already existing. She was a younger woman who decided to do something and she was lucky enough to be in a family with a means that uh, helped her build and buy this machine and she flew over Terra Nova. And this happened a century ago and it helped us structure uh, a natural environment, which is our air environment. And it also enables us to go beyond that space so now, right now, in the 25th century, digital space, with all of its software layers, we are defining the new space. How are we going to fly in the future? I would like to draw this metaphor. How is going this new space going to look like? With machines, lines of code, we need to define this new space. And I do hope that we will define this new space, leaving fear apart. I would very much like to think that in 2017, before the pandemic, 88% of Europeans uh, well feared AI. So we need to radically change this because this space already exists. Humans are already creating lines of code and we are already living in a digital space. So in Europe, we need to be fearless and we need to define the new digital space and to make it an enabler so that we are equipped with European values that allows us to live in a place with rights because we are all diverse. We are very different from each other. And this means that we will need to design uh, our digital space. And I would like to, I like to talk design by default with ethics. 
So it's about ethics by design. Let's design applying ethics from the very beginning. It's nothing specific about what we want, how we want to live in the future. Let's innovate the new world. Let's define the metaverse. And in order to do so, we need to do something that is very complex for human beings. And we do not always succeed, which is to be aligned and to reach consensus and to be able to manage different profiles, rights, technology, sociology. And when all of this is amplified, we need to amplify space and dialogue amongst us. And that's the hard thing to do as human beings. But technology helps us. As you know, communication uh, is 7% words, 38% voice, and 55% body language. So the other ways as human being to move around. Well, digital space is still at the 7% of words. It is also with AI at somehow we are beginning to uh, program voice and voice recognition. So there's a small percentage below that 38%. And now we are leaving the sweet momentum in technology. We are now able to project, teleproject our bodies. And that's when we need to telecommunicate. So communication is a very human thing to do. So we need to do. We need to know what uh, we want to communicate. And since David is here next to me, I would like to share this project with you. A project that was uh, carried out together with Vodafone in order to incentivate young girls. Here we have the captain of the English national team who teletransported herself and she physically communicated with a young girl here on stage and also with many other young girls following the event. So she explained uh, her views on the, on the game and uh, her life experiences. So this is something that's possible thanks to technology nowadays. That was a source of inspiration and that's what we need to think about. How do we want to use AI in order to be a source of inspiration of European values? We are already developing the software. You have here an example, Geniverse, made in Europe and developed under uh, American equity. Well, this is something we should also think about, money, where does the money come from? And finally, yes, I think we are ready to take it to the next level to take risks and we, when we define legal frameworks, we should do so in order to define a new space, a new space that is open to all of us, not to limit that new space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Montserrat Guardia. So now I hand over to Artur Serra. He's the Deputy Director of i 2 Cat Foundation and Research Director of the City Lab in Catalonia. Okay, you're all set. Let's go. Okay, so 10 minutes. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I work at the I2Cat Foundation and we work on the internet. And there's something that I've been said is very important, the new IA. In 1986, Tommy Chill at Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon uh, opened machine learning to all of us. So that's nothing new, but now there's been an, a booming of data that has led to the current AI booming. So AI, it's not just a product. The approach that envisions AI as a mere product, well, I would say AI is much more than a product. And there are so many platforms, Google, Facebook, etc. They are not just products, they are big, a, a very large service. They are infrastructure. So they are in infrastructure over another layer of infrastructure and so on. And that makes up the internet. And that, that has a very strategic ele element. I analyzed the culture at Carnegie Mellon, and that's how big corporations understand AI, not from the perspective of the market, but from a strategic point of view military uh, perspective uh, from the US, military state in the case of China, and in Europe shouldn't limit itself uh, to see it from the market perspective. So we're seeing 
these services being used first for state, for public services, and then moving on to the private uh, companies. Self-driven cabs, for example, uh, Sebastian Kuhn, a disciple of Tim Mitchell, who developed a military self-driven vehicle. And it was then passed on to Google, who developed self-driven cars. And it, this happened with other digital products like the internet. And that's how the system ticks. In order to regulate AI, we need to understand first what it is and where does it come from and how does uh, IA precisely work and why are China and the US ahead of us? What we do in our group is to open a dialogue amongst communication engineering, IT experts, and uh, social science uh, experts, anthropologists in our ca case, working hand in hand to see where can we where can we go actually. This collaboration is very relevant, and we materialized our collaboration in the Catalan chapter of digital rights and responsibilities. That's an interesting story, by the way. The charter was developed not only because human rights were being threatened on the internet, but also because Catalonia wanted to become a leader in the protection of human rights and, and digital uh, rights. So it, all started with art, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And after a thorough assessment, it was said that only Article 27 said that everyone has the right to uh, freely take part in uh, social cultural activities and so on. But the word technology is non-existent in the Declaration of 1948. And of course, what well, Precisely 1948 was when the first computer ever was born, the ENIAC. And human rights have evolved historically. It was a first stage of uh, political and civil rights with revolutions, then there was the social revolution. And what we're seeing now is the new generation of human rights the society of knowledge. So this is at the onset. We're not going to finalize things by passing a law. We need to really tackle the discussion. What do human rights mean in the context of a digital age? So I would say that this should go on because this could lead to a full revamping of, of human rights and the future of the EU. In our chapter, we focused on opportunities. In the SWOT analysis, you identify first your opportunities and then the threats. But I'm going to do it the other way around. So you have to say first what do you want and then what you do not want. That was our strategy. And we identified big opportunities, for example, universal access to the internet. We defend that internet should be accessible for uh, everyone in our planet. And that's a big challenge. Then governance model, freedom of speech, digital innovation. I would like to focus on that one, digital innovation, creation, access and distribution of knowledge because knowledge is key, is of the essence here. We are research, researchers and of course we develop knowledge, but we, well, included this sentence, if we want open and inclusive societies, everyone should have the right to generate and share digital knowledge, the knowledge that allows to design, understand, build and assess new systems, applications and services in the digital areas, and also new economical, political, social and, and structures in the digital area and new ethics code rights and responsibility to access technological knowledge should be free and open. And don't look for the right to innovation in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because it, it's not there. It is something inherent to the digital era. The right to create is very specific to the uh, culture of creation, for example. The right to innovate 
in different areas of digital society is a new, un new universal human right and a responsibility of citizens of our times. And I think, it, of course, innovation must be done in a responsible manner. Then let's, well, we analyze the new EU AI Act, which is, uh, which is following a risk-based pol policy approach. And here we have a pyramid establishing different risk levels, non-acceptable risk, higher risk, limited risk, and low risk. These are two articles that talk about innovation, but uh, it's only 52, 53, but it's all inspired with this existential risk theory. This was uh, Mr. Bostrom in 2002. He started talking about an existential risk that endangers humanity. These are anthropogenic risks. This is not a meteorite that puts an end to dinosaurs. We generate these risks and machine learning is quoted as one of these existential risks. This is an interesting theory. If you've seen this one before, the existential opportunity theory, Otherwise, if we do not understand this one, we will close up. We will say no, we will reject the American model, the um, social network or social media dilemma. We don't want the Chinese control system. So which one do we want? Uh, what are we encouraging our researchers to do? What are we encouraging our startups to do? So the model is not clear and it's quite uh, determined by this risk category. So our main risk of the EU is that the EU will be um, left outside of AI development. And since we will be left outside, we will be subject to a knowledge infrastructure that will be developed by Americans or Chinese. And this is happening now. We need to be aware that uh, faced with a lack of not European Googles, but big AI European services, well, they obviously resort to others. So a possibility would be to develop a human-centric AI. And this has been uh, mentioned before with the entrepreneurial state. So which is the public sector that will be a driver of AI? And it's quite apparent. Um, social welfare, universal welfare, education and health. The systems that we came up with that were invented by Europe after the Second World War and that have um, that are unique of the European model, which is uh, not based on the military power, but on the economic and social power with these inclusive systems. So we are trying to convince the authorities uh, with these two principles. Number one, AI for everyone. It's uh, the model according to which internet was developed. When the Internet Society was founded, I became a member because that was the motto. Internet is for everyone. So we need to elaborate on this idea. AI is for everyone, everyone to basically dwell on the human-centric systems because we do have human-centric systems, um, health, education and social welfare. We were pioneers in this matter. And secondly, AI is not for war. This is the main distinction, distinction that we can make um, from the American model. Um, we're not talking about Google or Facebook. We are talking about 70 years of AI funded by the um, Department of Defense. We know this. I spent three years there. I met everyone and we know where this technological superiority of the Americans comes from. Uh, and it has been followed very close by the Chinese and the Israelis. And companies, of course, have short-term goals. They cannot invest in a research field for 60 years because back to the time, they didn't know what the purpose of this was. It's a high-risk research area that can only be sustained with public funds. I've been hammering with this for 20 years. It has to be the public sector 
the taxpayers' money sector that has to invest, and not only they need to invest for researchers to do their job. Of course, you're paying for this research and then you own it. The military vehicles of the American, the self-driving military vehicles of the American military have been paid by the public sector. It's because their public sector leads this process in the US. We don't have that goal. We have a civil goal, a service-based goal. So let's invest in this sector. We've given you two additional minutes. Well, there are some examples in Catalonia, social robotics, there was an initial speaker who spoke for two minutes less than he had. And this is for the citizenship, for everyone to be familiar with AI. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arthur Serra. And now Josep Lados, director of the Computer Vision Center. Good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here discussing my field of expertise, AI. I could be extremely brief because many of the ideas I had prepared to share with you have already been brought up by my fellow speakers and they have done it brilliantly. So I totally agree with them, but I'll try to um, contribute with um, some nuances or new pieces of information. As Arthur said, I come from a research center, the CVC at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. I've been working in the academia for 30 years, well, in the scientific sphere. So my vision comes from the field of knowledge generation, which is the field in which, and I don't want to be misunderstood, I'm not saying that we should not be regulated, but we do not love regulations because you have to break the ice of the innovation chain. As Arturo said, if this is not done by the public sector, if that long-term risk is not taken on by the public sector, no one, no one will. So sometimes these regulations try to limit what's, what cannot be limited really in terms of knowledge generation. As it's been said, let me start talking about the perimeter. Since AI has become popular, I mean, AI has springs and winters. And uh, someone mentioned the new AI when there's a new paradigm, when there's a revolution. I mean, AI has been around for many years, since the 60s. Um, that's when the concept was coined. But it's had ups and downs. And we are up now because there's this deep learning paradigm in terms of methodologies, but also uh, in terms of calculation power, supercomputers, big computation systems, and someone mentioned the internet a second ago, and uh, AI has been democratized. We all have a device in our pocket today full of apps that solve different daily life problems, and there's AI behind them. But when we talk about regulating AI, when we aim to generate certification mechanisms, I feel that we are mistaken. We mistake AI as an IT area that tries to replicate cognitive processes um, like humans do with the digital world or software at large. So if we regulate AI, let's have very clear in mind what AI is and what does it mean to replicate human reasoning? Someone from the audience mentioned before that we seem to be regulating on the grounds of fear. 
I don't know if that's the case, but sometimes there's a message being conveyed to our society to instill fear because we seem to say that AI will kill us. Um, robots will replace us. There are many risks that need to be controlled. Um, many examples have been given here. Let me move on to the risks and moving on with the perimeter. We talk about the risks of AI it's not about the regulation of AI itself. It's the regulation of AI uses. That is the end user application that use specific AI algorithms that um, might have been developed with uh, beneficial purposes, but then they are wrongly used. They are abused. That's what we need to regulate, not AI as such. No one has mentioned the ethics or the regulation of medicine as such. So if someone develops a drug and then someone abuses that drug and poisons someone with that drug, well, it's an abuse of the drug, but originally the drug had a good intent. So it's important to speak properly it's AI uses that we need to regulate, not algorithms as such. Many of these examples have been mentioned, and I don't want to be long because we don't have much time, but someone mentioned the recruitment processes. The regulation in recruitment processes with biased algorithms, uh, men, women. Actually, recently we saw a piece of news that in the US, in New York particularly, they will be very stringent with the use of system, systematic systems when it comes to recruitment processes. So what does an algorithm do in a recruitment process? It analyzes the body language of the person, of the candidate, when responding to the interview question. So these algorithms that analyze facial expressions, body language, this can be properly used. Let's talk, let, let's think about um, home robotics, existential robotics, I don't know, um, an algorithm that identifies the fall of an elderly person or an old person expressing pain in their face. These are algorithms. So AI, the algorithm is not evil, is not bad as such. It's the use that can become an abuse. We're talking about the social media. If the social media algorithms are used for um, counter-terrorism purposes, well, that's a positive use. But if we talk about Cambridge Analytica, exactly the same social media algorithms, but with evil purposes to basically canvas for votes and to poach elections, basically. So it's an abuse. Or the self-driving vehicle. It's uh, the typical case. It's, it needs to be regulated because who will be liable if at some point a vehicle decides to run over the person on its right and not the person on its left? Well, so these are these kind of um, wary tales like careful, let's see what happens. Well, probably the self-driving cars will solve pollution problems, traffic jam problems, um, rural areas problems, um, taking care of people who need to go to hospital. So once again, algorithms are not the problem in any event. This needs to be regulated and there are many indicators that have been mentioned, um, the bias, um, to explain AI, sustainability. For example, here in Catalonia, in the ethical observatory on AI, they have presented a self-assessment model. It's open, it's based on 
obser observable indicators and basically you can check your products or systems against these principles to see if they um, stand the test. I don't have much time, I believe. I'd like to insist on something. I started by saying that I talk to you as a, science, as a scientist uh, from the lens of the knowledge generation. I want to claim that. We mentioned sustainability not long ago. What happened to the deep learning revolution or the mass data analytics? Well, we are building algorithms. They are very powerful and they do very interesting things, but they need huge calculation power. So the energy consumption is huge, the associated energy consumption. And from an environmental and sustainability standpoint, well, we are solving some problems, but we are eating away the environment. So rather than regulating, which is also needed, we might have to incentivize innovation. These very powerful and energy consuming algorithms that and data consuming algorithms that we have today, well, we should alleviate them and have them um, use less data and energy to facilitate progress. Thank you. Yes. Well, you began by saying that you had nothing to add. It wasn't the case. Okay, so we will wrap up with Josep Luis Martí Marmol, Commissioner for the Planetary Wellbeing Initiative at the Pompeu Fabra University and Associate Professor of Politics and Philosophy of Law. And then we will have a Q&A we have some questions on the chat and we will bring the session to a close. Thank you very much to the organizers for the idea, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to belong to this fantastic panel. I'll try not to repeat elements that have been brought up because I don't want to bore anyone down because it's quite late in the evening. And I want to thank the interpreters. Hopefully the interpreters are not, no algorithms, hopefully and they will be able to interpret my irony in my speech. I'm a legal expert, uh, um, politics expert, um, political science expert, and I have devoted my career to theory of democracy and ethical matters. I will talk about this, and it's been mentioned in some um, speeches, but I will focus on this and I will assess the law because I, I cannot uh, refrain myself from doing it as a legal expert. I will assess the positive um, and the negative elements. The positive things, I'll spend a minute on that and I will focus on the negative ones because they are more fun. As well, the bright side, I will not elaborate on this. Uh, this is the first act. It's not a strategy or a series of principles or recommendations or statements. We have plenty of those in many cities, regions and countries, but it's the first true act that regulates this and it aims to regulate it and it goes back to um, revising some elements. So we need to celebrate. Celebrations are due because AI is a game changer it will open up new opportunities. I'm an optimist, so I always see the bright side of things, but there are risks too. So it needs to be celebrated. But in terms of data protection, the EU is leading the regulation of these matters globally. Everything can be improved. Um, nothing is perfect, but there's no other region of the world that has taken the regulation of these matters so seriously. And regarding the criticism I have, well, everything can be improved. And if the regulation is finally adopted, well, 
of course, uh, we will um, keep um, criticizing it so that it improves. And we need to celebrate the consensus process, the uh, stakeholder process, which is quite um, the case uh, in the EU, and it has taken place here too, and the concern about non-discrimination, ethical principles, that's all in the Act. Okay, enough with the bright side. I'll focus on three negative aspects. The second one specifically, because it has to do with democracy, but I will um, say in passing the first and the third. I will not delve into the technical matters. Some of them have been discussed in the first panel. The law proposes a series of measures that let's see how they are implemented. Legal experts are used to reading a law and then wondering how it, it is it will be enforced. The conformity agreements, how they will be assessed. Well, we'll see. Let's not anticipate and let's um, be optimistic. First, this act is a classical act. And I mean that it encompasses all the principles and all the modern approaches and powerful approaches of the last 20 years. It tries to implement um, the principle of better legislation, risk assessment, impact assessment. This is the ABC of um, the regulation of the last 20 years, and we have it. Um, it could be considered as positive, but it's a missed opportunity. Uh, we could have done something different. And someone said it in passing. Someone said, this is not only a product, this is not a matter of market, this is a game changer. And it's not included in the act because they talk about the industry, the provider, the, the distributor, as if this was just another market industry. But there are many things um, at stake here. They could have gone for crowd law systems or uh, collective intelligence applied to public decisions, citizens intelligence. Um, hopefully they will change the way uh, they have proceeded in the future. I think that the law's scope could be much broader. It's too stringent and too classical. Moving on to my second point. These, the document that has been circulated, including the preliminary um, chapters, are 150 pages, and there are only two references to democracy. In the prior consideration, so in the articles, there's no mention of democracy. There's, it's true that there's a reference to Annex 1, and if you dig hard, uh, you'll find it. But only two references to democracy. One to say that AI poses a huge risk for democratic processes. I fully agree with that. We have many examples, Cambridge Analytica, for example, but that's only the most well-known. There are many others. The, I don't want to instill fear in anyone. Uh, it's a reality check. If we are interested in democracy, we have to take the European principles and values. And one of those is democracy. And it's as important as fundamental rights and non-discrimination, or even more important, because if there is no democracy, there will be no fundamental rights and the non-discrimination principle will not be upheld. So that's quite shocking because uh, when I first read the document, I'm not a provider. I, I hope I will never be a provider. So I am interested in the democratic regulation of the document. So uh, the reading was not 100% pleasant. So there are two references. Uh, the first one to say that this is a great threat for democracy, fundamental rights, et cetera. So if this is a threat, let's see which are the solutions that are proposed. And the second reference is to say that one of the criteria to define the high risk in these um, four categories are algorithms applied to democratic processes. I agree, that's a high risk. There's no shade of a doubt. Anything that you do with a democratic process, it, poses a high risk in terms of um, politics and democracy. When it comes to finding solutions to fight against this risk, or rather from a positive lens, the implementation of this should be a new opportunity to strengthen democracy. It was said that algorithms can be used to improve our intelligence and our nature at the beginning. And you said that at the beginning of this technology, 
for example, Aglas Engelbart, one of the fathers of the Stanford uh, Research Institute, he invented the mouse, but he said out loud, he was not talking about AI, but about computers or um, IT. And he said, this new technology has to be at the service of human intelligence. It should strengthen it. So AI should be at the service of human intelligence. Of course, we have time to change that and to include these nuance, but I would have loved to find this in the text to defend democracy as a defense or from a positive lens to have a tool uh, that can help us improve democratic processes and to stay away from fear. So it would have been key to involve the citizens. It's true that they talk to the stakeholders, to experts, but what do citizens complain about? Which is the number one complaint of citizens when discussing the EU? Well, the number one complaint is that they are technocrats, that they are far away from citizens, that they regulate from Brussels. So this was a golden opportunity to involve the citizens in the drafting of the Act. They conducted consultations, but not enough and this is quite apparent in the proposal, in the text. And it would have been great to teach people about AI, which is key. So I totally see this as a missed opportunity. And in terms of governance, um, the only thing that they propose is to set up a European AI committee that will have a series of powers issuing reports following up and not much more and basically there will be state representatives and experts but no citizens will be represented there and of course uh, something that we need to applaud is the transparency element it's very important it's the number one step if we want to build democracy but the democracy is not only transparency and if I have 30 additional seconds, because I'm sure that this will not be understood, so I'd rather be brief and say it quickly and avoid your criticism. This is a European regulation that aims to regulate the European market and the operators that operate in the European market, both European and foreign, of course, the way it should be. But in the world in which we live, we have other instruments, especially when faced with these problems. This is a global problem and the European regulation will not solve the global issues. But today we have instruments and I'll give you two examples and I'll wrap up with that. The soft law instruments that can be found in the law for some of these AI uses, since they are soft law instruments, they do not rely on powers on regulation powers and this could become universal principles uh, so we could encourage people to adopt them uh, in a, with a more global um, calling and in the few cases in which AI uses are banned they are in article 5 and I'll read the first one when it talks about the commissioning and use of an AI system that uh, that are subliminal techniques that transcend the awareness, the consciousness of a person to alter their behavior, resulting in psychological or physical damage to a person. I totally agree with this ban, but it's only banned if it happens in Europe. So a provider, a company, a TNC that violates human rights, that poaches elections, that manipulates elections, and that generates phys physical or psychological damage um, to people in other continents, well, they will be able to keep doing that according to the European regulation. So that's a missed opportunity to hold liable those companies that do that and that operate in Europe uh, too. So they should, they should have to prove that they comply with the law everywhere. Otherwise, it will happen what happens in other areas. Many of our fellow scientists, when they have to research something that is banned in Europe, they basically outsource that piece of research to other countries. And peace of mind for everyone, because this is a global thing. I would have loved um, to find these elements. These are constructive criticisms. Uh, this act has not been 
adopted. Hopefully it will be adopted and I'm sure that it will be changed in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joseph Luis Martí Marmol. Thank you to all speakers taking part in the second panel. So now we will focus on the questions we received via chat. And now, well, it's up to you. You have to uh, see who wants to reply. And I know that some of you have some material left. We have 10 minutes left before this workshop is over. So please keep it brief and shortly. So the question is, as it was said, IA is algorithm plus data and regulations, safety regulations favor big corporations that they can afford that they can afford them. Smaller actors cannot accumulate data and co compete against the big ones. Some would say that is uh, that this has been the problem in Europe compared to the US and uh, China, shouldn't it be now high time to put the citizen as data owner instead of companies and to make it a general right? I don't know who wants to reply, maybe Arthur Serra and Montserrat, okay. Okay, I would like to say that nowadays data should be first open, we should know what kind of data we have. So data in itself are not so relevant. What matters is what we do with uh, those data and to transform them into knowledge and to create ideas uh, based on knowledge. So data should be open of quality and we will process them later into information and progress. Mm. Well, it has been said that we are a, a regulatory superpower, but we are also a huge market, right? American companies play in a huge market, right? That's why they are so big. And large research digital centers receive lots of funding from the US government because the US government buys their products. And then they keep these to the big fishes on the market. We have a big European market with a supranational authority. We are the only continent in the world with a supranational body countries have uh, given authority and competencies to a supranational authorities. So governments within the EU should buy the outcomes of research. We should establish a big digital research center, European one, like the Americans do with the MIT, Stanford, etc. And so that SMEs can make the most and capitalize on the large European market. We talk so much about digital sovereignty, right? That would be a stronger regulatory way. The weak one would be, well, that's up to the Americans and the Chinese, and then we set some regulations that must be upheld when operating in Europe. There are other ways to do so that could be uh, explored So maybe it's time to explore this model outside the European market. Just in 10 seconds, and building on what my colleagues just said, data are absolutely of the essence in a democratic governance uh, driven by data-driven economy. It's like transparency and democratic participating, the data sharing and other collaborating, collaboration models, uh, public private partnerships. But it all goes back in involving citizens and engaging citizens. That's the main challenge here. And it's, it's so important. Well, does anyone here in the audience have uh, any further questions? Otherwise we will proceed to the closure of this workshop. And before we close the session, 
just let me remind you that you can watch the whole session on the uh, Esquerra Internacional's YouTube channel. You can re-watch the workshop. And now Jordi Soler, please come up on stage for the closing remarks. Thank you so much, everyone. I think it's been a really interesting workshop. We, there's been a discussion around IA. Different perspectives and standpoints have been shared. I think they are complementary to each other. And I believe that your ideas and thoughts help all of us contributing, somehow contributing in the shaping of the European uh, regulation. I would pick one sentence to reach consensus. IA regulation, the EU IAA regulation is necessary. We all want it, but we need to go beyond the regulation of risks. The regulation needs to incentivize its potential all, and all of the positive facets of AI. We've been discussing around a proposal of a, an act. But bear in mind that when the EU passes a law, a regulation, an act, it is the result of consensus after consensus after consensus. And I don't think there's any other legisl legislative environment in the world that takes into account so many diverse opinions and where consensus is so important. There is the European Commission and co-legislators are now working on reaching a shared uh, standpoint. In the European Parliament, there are different committees as well. Speakers are trying to come up with consensus proposals based on thousands of um, amends then there are 27 member states trying to uh, agree on a common standpoint and the Czech presidency is doing a great effort to reach uh, such consensus. And then we'll have the Tridux, the, tri, uh, the three party negotiations with the commission acting as a facilitator. So when we reach the end and when the regulation is finally uh, published and disclosed, which will be a regulation uh, of compulsory application and implementation, we will have completed a whole process based on reaching consensus. And I think that's one of the virtues of our situation. We build a space uh, on the grounds of dialogue, trying to uh, listening to all voices. I'm sure that that might never be enough, but I can assure you it's an extraordinary experience of reaching consensus. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you so much to everyone following this event online and on site. And rest assured, we will continue working so that the AI regulation really uh, sets the path on the grounds of European values. Thank you so much.